everyone, you are listening to She Leads with Carly. Our guest today is Komal Kurtikar. Komal is the Senior Vice President and Head of Marketplace at Opportunity at Work. And before this role, she joined Lyft as their first general manager in their first market in San Francisco, to then rise to the Senior Director role of Product Marketing. We talk about her career spanning from engineering to her realization that she loves the operational and business side. She received her MBA from Harvard and also dabbled in consulting at Bain. There are so many incredible lessons to take away from this one. And one thing you'll notice about Komal's career that I mentioned is that she really follows her passion throughout her career and she never questions it. And I love that. So I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. Hello, Komal. Thank you so much for coming on to She Leads today. I'm so excited to have you on this show. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carly. Good to see you. Of course. I'm excited to be here. Of course, me too. So, Komal, you are the Senior Vice President and Head of Marketplace at Opportunity at Work. But before mm-hmm. this role, you, you worked at Lyft for five plus years as Senior Director of Product Marketing, Director of Consumer Customer Service, and then you were also the first General Manager of its first branch in SF, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. So I'm excited to talk about that. But then even prior to that, you know, you got your MBA from Harvard Business School. You went into the consulting track at Bain. And so, you know what, before even going to all of that, I Mm want to know, take me all the way back to University of Florida. You got your degree in mechanical engineering, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. And so, so tell me what, you know, in college, what was going in your mind? Did you have this whole, you know, career planned out for you? Or how did you imagine your career at this stage? (laughs) Yeah, I knew rideshare was going to be a thing back then. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so I did not have it all planned out. I will say that I studied mechanical engineering because I thought I wanted to go into biomedical engineering. And mechanical engineering was like a nice foundation. And I'd get my master's in biomed and I'd go work at a you know medical device company. Like that was my plan. Right. And then I started doing research on campus in biomedical um, you know labs. Okay. And the research felt a little bit isolating and the work itself didn't, you know, give me a lot of energy, but I loved hearing about the outcomes and reading about the learnings. And so after a few summers of doing that, I then took an internship at Anheuser-Busch, but in their brewery, and they were taking engineering students as interns to be operations managers on their brewery floor. Mm. So I just said, you know what, let's just try it out. Sounds like fun. It was, you know, in Jacksonville on the beach for a summer. Yeah. And that's when I really started learning about manufacturing and operations and how engineering can also be applied to things that were, you know, operating and efficiencies and flowing and product output. Um, and I loved the interpersonal, wow. you know, interactions in the work on a day-to-day basis. And so that's how I eventually, you know, flowed into more of the ops and business side. Yeah. And did you have, you know, people mentoring you along the way saying, you know, first of all, even like the internship aspect, like take these internships, it's okay not knowing versus like, no, you should kind of know this, this, and this and have your kind of your next five years set out. Yeah. Um, Carly, I wish I did. (laughs) I will say I had more role models. So in my family, my dad, my uncles, my grandfather, they all had studied engineering. They probably, you know, practiced it and then went on to the business side of, you know, their work management side, if you will. And so I always in my mind thought that that was going to be my path, but I didn't know how quickly, I didn't really know what operations was, manufacturing operations. And I didn't know how fast I would then actually move into that instead. Um, but I wish that I had found more mentors. And I will say this, you know, I didn't take an internship until towards the end of my college career. And if there's anything that I would go back and do differently, I would definitely have done internships early and often because nothing in college <laughs> prepares you for yep. like, you know, being able to explore different industries and functions and companies and knowing what you like to do in the workplace. Um but I'm glad I did one at least, you know, towards the end. Yeah, definitely. I, I can say on my end, I wish as well. But, you know, as for soccer, as a soccer player in Stanford, mm-hmm. you have your fall season. So the internship gap is like mm-hmm. so minimal. So that's yeah. something that I'm like, oh, I wish. So I kind of did it during the school year, like as part of the school and then oh, also. So, but that's worked, great but, too. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so Wonderful. as you approach the end of college, 
you know, you're now transitioning from college to real life. How did you yeah. navigate this? How did you find your first company? You know, this is the perfect role for me. And how did you outlook it? Yeah, totally. So I, well, one thing I'll say too, just very specifically, because I know your audience is, you know, there are a lot of females in the audience right. and I had joined the Society of Women Engineers at University of Florida, to be honest, initially as a resume builder, mm -hmm. right? Like I thought, okay, I'll be in this affinity group and I have friends from other disciplines in engineering who are in it. It'll be fun. But I think two things came out of that. One is it started that foundation for me in terms of knowing how to build confidence in being in a very male centric right. environment, knowing that there are other strong females going through similar things. Um, and it also was the way to be honest that I got my first job into GE aviation in their operations management leadership program, their OMLP program, yeah. because GE had come to university of Florida and, you know, it was in a big auditorium with everybody and the the line to the GE booth was out the door. And I said, okay, I don't need to stand in that line. Like, you know, I'll go somewhere else. Yeah. But then I went to a society of women engineers conference and, you know, there were like GE women behind the booth mm. and it just felt more approachable. And I went and that's, you know, when I finally had the interview and, and that's how I got into the program. And it's just, it's a, I feel like it's a reminder that, you know, you, it's, it's a good thing to find, your crew, find your group, yeah. take advantage of the fact that there are these affinity groups for women at all stages of your education and career, yeah. you know, because it is an important support system and confidence. Yeah. And I think that just shows how important it is to highlight, you know, people like you, these incredible females who are at that stage and can show <laughs> young females like myself, younger than me to be like, okay, look, you know, they've gotten there. You can too. So mm -hmm. I'm also wondering now that you brought that up, you know, you mentioned your dad was an engineer, your uncle. These are all male figures. And I'm sure you saw mm -hmm. a lot of male figures. Is that something that ever, you know, held you back and said like, okay, maybe, maybe I shouldn't go into this because it is so male dominated? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. So I, that's a very complicated answer. I'll say this. Yeah. I had a lot of pride ever since I was little to be able to beat out boys at things. It. Right. So like, yeah. Growing up, I was very tall and I could run faster than boys. I mean, until like third grade, but still, you know, there was a <laughs> yeah. pride in that. There was a pride that I had in high school to be, you know, a mathlete or to be able, you know, to, to outdo. And I was like on a co-ed soccer team, for example. Um, and so I think there was always that, that pride in me. But what I didn't fully realize is until well into my career, and, you know, we could talk about this is actually how much implicit bias there is in the workplace between gen between genders, excuse me. And because I was always so proud that I could, quote unquote, keep up with the guys, I don't think I let myself truly see that until well into my career. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I was on the manufacturing shop floor at GE with men who were twice my age who had been working at GE for longer than I'd been alive, you know, yeah. who, and I just, you know, you feel like, okay, you've got street cred or, you know, I was one of like five women in all of mechanical engineering in my class at UF. Right. So you, you sort of build this confidence of, okay, like I can go toe to toe, but, um, it wasn't until later in my career when I had a career coach and I was, you know, I've been parts of different leadership teams, but there've been several times where I'm the only female and it's a lot of other men alpha men at the table. Um, and I remember talking to my career coach saying, you know, there are these multiple instances where I've brought up an idea or a thought and it's been sort of dismissed or laughed at, but then so many months later, suddenly it's brought up again by someone else. And then it's, you know, the thing that we're doing. Right. And he reflected on me, right? He said, well, Como, are you the only woman in the room? And I, I dismissed that at first. I'm like, that's not what it is. Like, clearly it's something with me. Right. But then when you start looking at multiple instances, multiple environments, and you realize how it is different when you are on a team with multiple women versus you are the only one, like it's just, there is implicit bias, even with the most good natured, best intentioned yep. peers. Um, and sometimes women do it to each other too, you know? And so I think that it's a journey we're all on. This is a very long answer to your question. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. And it's so I'm, so obviously I want to, I want to go on to, you know, your career, getting MBA and all that. Yeah. Um, but quickly, just before we go on, 
you know, for someone, for a woman in that situation where, as you said, like all good intentions, great employees, great coworkers, whatever they may be, but they have that implicit bias. How do you deal with that in a way where, you know, you don't, not only do you, you know, have that inner negative self-talk and think it's yourself, but also maybe address it to them and raise, raise it. How do you have any advice on that? So the first thing I'll say is I check myself. So oftentimes when there are other women in the room and they're saying an idea, and if I find myself reacting in a way that's not positive, I actually will go through the mental exercise of, okay, well, if it wasn't her and if it was this other man, like how would I have reacted? Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's helpful actually just to put yourself through it because we're all, you know, sort of grown up in that certain environment. That's one thing. But I think the second thing is, um, it's always helpful after you've noticed a pattern, right. And you, because oftentimes when it's happened the first time, at least for me, I always question if it was the way that I said something, I could always improve my communication. It's true for all of us. Right. Um, but I think it's always helpful to find that pattern one, two, be able to explicitly state it to assuming you have a manager, right? Like someone who can vouch for you, but also a peer and not ju- and, and by the way, I think having female peers is so important. You know, like I, we could talk about that as well, right. who you can talk through these things with, but also the male peers, the male peers who, you know, are trying to be advocates for women yeah. and, um, you know, and being able to bring everyone's voices to the table because, sometimes they don't even see it, right? Mm -hmm. Once again, even if they are well-intentioned. So even if they didn't do it themselves, but they were in the room, I think it's like like two or three times is a pattern and that's enough to just take to someone and say, hey, listen, this is what I've been noticing. Can you also just help? So if I say something, make sure that it's, you know, help me make sure that it's heard and or call out if someone's dismissed it, right? Right. Um, Because I think, and, and that's actually been effective for me, um, you know, to be able to, to build the team around me, but, and then we also have to do it for other women as yeah, well. Definitely. I love that. I think even just, even as like a good life lesson is almost, you know, for those alpha males, for the females, whoever may be, it's just like step out mm-hmm. of yourself, you know, like step mm-hmm. into the situation, recognize that yeah. they're not, they don't look like you. They're different than you, like whatever it may be. So right. I love that. I think that's so important. Okay. So going on now, you know, kind of in a box, getting an MBA from Harvard business school and then going into <laughs> consulting. So yeah. Kind of walk me through this framework. Were you in this mindset, you know, people are going to business school, consulting is a, you know, a pretty common path after I should learn, yeah. I could learn a lot from this. How were you thinking about that process? Uh, excellent question. So, you know, I was at GE literally working on the shop floor and frontline manager knew I wanted to move up in, into leadership. And so I went to get my MBA because that was a path I had seen others right. go down, right? Um, while I was there, I realized that I wasn't quite sure what that next step on my pathway was, right? Like what was the kind of company I wanted to go into? Um, and I knew that at GE, I had very tactical operational experience. I wanted to get, you know, and and at business school, you study all these different business leaders and the major decisions they have to make, et cetera, and the strategic, um, thinking and teams and decisions that they have to go through. So I said, okay, let's, try it in consulting because I don't know what industry I want to go into yet. I don't know what function I want to have, but I'll be able to get a flavor of that and build on those core skills. Right. So I think as much as I am an advocate of going into startup life and being able to, you know, really experience that, um, adventure, if you will, I do appreciate the foundation that I had professionally at large companies like GE and at Bain, because I think in terms of the way that you communicate and, you know, can operate within a corporate setting is a great set of fundamentals to take into wherever you go. Right. And the problem solving you learn. So that's what I, that's why I decided to go into Bain afterwards. It was also partially because I didn't know what else I would really want to do quite yet. And I think consulting is the value is that you do get a taste of different industries and different companies. Absolutely. So it gives you that like kind of that foundation, which is great. And yeah. then, you know, in consulting where you like, I love this, I could stay here. This is you yeah. know for the next few <laughs> years or was Lyft kind of coming up and how did, how did that transition happen? Yeah. So basically, um, first of all, I loved Bain. I mean, the people there were amazing. Yeah. The work 
it's very, it's so interesting because after having been so operational to then go all the way to consulting where you are in decks and PowerPoints, you know, and you're talking just at the C-suite, there's such a gap in between. And I was missing the, the operational, the executional aspect of it. Right. And so I knew that I wanted to find something in between. Right. And I wanted, and this is where the idea of going into a startup came about because you even you have to, especially when a startup is small, you have to be thinking and problem solving at a strategic level, but operating and executing at the frontline level because you are doing both, right? I mean, it's just such a small organization. So I knew I I wanted to go into startups and I moved from Chicago to the Bay Area without a job, just knew I wanted to explore the startup world. And at the time, um, it was in 2012, Lyft had just come out. And I moved from Chicago where there were taxis everywhere and I moved to San Francisco without a car um, and the taxis were not, were not everywhere. And it was really difficult for me to get one. And, and the public transportation system wasn't as robust as it was in the Chicago area. So anyway, long story short, started using Lyft, became a huge fan, had no idea that I would work there just a couple months later um, because I got connected with the team. Given how big of a fan I was, like basically I met a friend who knew the founders. And so oh. she introduced me. So it wasn't like Lyft was ever intentional, but startup life was. Um, and when I joined Lyft at the end of 2012, the city of San Francisco was actually looking at shutting down rideshare. And so I thought it was going to be an experience for a few months, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that it would be fun. Um, little did I know how many years later, you know, it would still be growing and thriving. That's crazy. Okay. I can go into so many different directions, but just quickly, you know, you first went into as a general manager, correct? Like yes. that was, mm-hmm. so given that the city of San Francisco were, you know, thinking of shutting down ride sharing, is that something that you were dealing with on a, you know, you were at the center of that or what was your kind of day to day for it as a GM? Yeah. Um, you know, it was more of the, and I really have to thank this team. Like it was more of the legal team and, mm-hmm. you know, our public relations team and right. government relations team. So they were really focusing on that with the city. Um, uh, as a general manager for San Francisco, I was really mo- most focused on bringing on drivers and the driver's well-being once they had joined, which meant in this scenario early on, also working with some of the taxi companies because the taxi drivers were not happy with the Lyft drivers and there right. was some on-road clashing that was happening that wasn't great. And so that was more of where my um, focus was, but but it was mostly on the driver's side just because we had such a high demand from the passengers. Crazy. And then how big was Lyft when you joined? At what stage were they at? Yeah. So I think it was a it was 12 people, but most of the team was working on Zimride, which is the company that Lyft was yeah. before it, you know, it started this you know, direct to passenger yeah, app. Exactly. Um yeah. So it was pretty small. Wow, that's crazy. Okay. So now at this small startup you know, a lot of people wonder whether, you know, going straight into a startup and then a big company, or do you need that foundation of a big company? Kind of when you were at Lyft, were you so thankful that you were at GE, you were at Bain, you got that kind of, you know, structured mentorship type yeah. of learning? It's a, it's a great question, Carly. And it's so funny because I came in from the East Coast with my MBA and my consulting <laughs> background, and that is right. not typical for what a startup is looking for so early on. I think you know, they took a chance on me because I was just so excited and passionate about the app um, and the whole service. I don't, I can't say there's a perfect formula. I will say the higher up. So uh, the bigger, the more developed that the startup is and the higher up of a role that you want to take, some of that foundation is really important. You know, I met and know so many people who started at Lyft straight out of undergrad and did go into like, you know, some of these account executive, customer service, engineering roles, and they learned so much, right, in a whole different way. Yeah. So I don't think there's a formula, Carly. You know, I think you could go either direction. I will say, depending on where in the evolution of size the startup is, yeah. there are different moments where they would like somebody with a little bit more foundational experience. Yeah. And I think that's a little bit later on. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, either way, I think if you're passionate about what the startup is doing, right. that's the most important part. And you're willing to, you know, jump in and, and learn along the way. Yeah, I think that's actually, I was going to mention that is, you know, you mentioned you'd love Lyft even before. I think that's probably one of the golden nuggets almost like in finding a job is like, you want to be passionate about it, 
even you know, before before even knowing that there's a role open for you or whatever may happen. So totally, I love that. Yeah. And okay, you know, twelve people—that's a small startup, especially for you know where it is today. Was there uh-huh. a weird transition for you? Like, was it challenging? Because you know, say you could be great at a big company, but that means nothing at a startup that's twelve people. So yeah. how was that? Totally. Um, yes, I will say that the transition at the very beginning, again, because I think I loved what we, what Lyft was doing and also the people were genuinely wonderful people. Like I went through so many interviews before I started there that, I mean, looking back, maybe I'm looking back at it with rose colored glasses, but I don't remember that transition being, you know, the most painful. I would say, um, along the way in any startup, especially one that's going through such hyper growth, there were points in time that it felt really painful. Mm. And that, I mean, I think those times would be marked by when some of the senior executives switched out, you know, somebody left and a new one came in and, you know, because there's just so much that happens and so many learnings you're trying to go through. And those were the times that I look back on thinking it got really hard and I got really close to saying, okay, I've done what I need to do here. But then the org would change, the leadership would change a little bit. Like the founders always stayed, they're still there. Yeah. Um, you know, but they'd hire on new people and then my role would shift and our strategy would shift a little bit, you know, and you, you kind of saw the next step. And I'm very grateful that those next steps always ended up being positive. Yeah, definitely. And then, so take me to where you are, you know, today. First, tell me a little bit more about Opportunity at Work, what you yeah. guys do, and then your role there as the SVP and head of Marketplace. Absolutely. So Opportunity at Work is focused on workforce development. Um, Very specifically, there is a demographic we focus on that we call STARS, so Skilled Through Alternative Routes. And these are people who do not have four-year college degrees. And it's fascinating because over the last several decades in the U.S., the number of roles that have added on a requirement for someone to have a four-year college degree has grown, Mm -hmm. Um, but the number of people who have them has declined because it's getting increasingly expensive, right? Right. And so you have a lot of very smart people who do get trained through other routes, whether it be on the job or in training programs or even community college. Um, And we want to increase the job opportunities. So career path, middle wage job opportunities, because people do have the skills. And so um, what I am doing with them is we have a marketplace that allows employers who want to hire stars mm. and training providers who have you know trained up stars to find each other on this marketplace. And it's a matching engine. So when an employer puts a job posting and the skills they need for the job posting and the star comes on and puts their profile with those skills they have, we can match them up wow. with the skills. There, I love it. With the skills matching score. Yeah. That's so awesome. it was great because when I finally did leave Lyft, sociopolitically, I knew I wanted to do something in the U.S. uh, that was focused around workforce development. They were building a marketplace. I had just come from a double-sided marketplace at Lyft. They knew that I had done a lot of like the operational sides, customer service, the marketing sides. And so it was a great role to be able to do all of that in one place. Definitely. So first, first, Como, like just even hearing your story, one thing I love is that throughout your career, you followed your passions and like, (laughs) and you haven't really questioned them. You know, like you, you thought engineering and then you found you like the business operational side, you went with that. And then you, you love Lyft, you went with that. And then you wanted to work in the sociopolitical, the workplace. So yeah. I think that's like, like a very true, like that's what keeps us happy. And, you know, where the integration Absolutely. of work and passion and life and all that come together. So I really appreciate that. I like it a lot. Yeah. I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time working. You may as well exactly. really be excited about it. Definitely. And so one thing I actually, I love to ask my guests is, when, you know, like looking back in your career, looking at now, what is your perception of failure? Like when you fail, what, what does that mean to you? And how do you kind of um, respond to that? Yeah, that is such a hard question. Yeah. And I think for me, I mean, so part of being an extroverted worker and thinker is that I'm also then very driven by helping others. Yeah. And I think I feel worst when I fail others. So if it's somebody who especially is like on my team who I'm trying to lead. Right. And even if it's like a small misstep, like I give them, you know, like the wrong set of directions and I need to set them on course again, or if it's, I think earlier 
on in my career too. I was such a people pleaser. And so when I started at GE at the age of 22, I was managing people. Right. And, um, that's very early and it's hard to deliver bad news, especially if you do feel like you've built up trust with somebody because of like the good relationship you have with them, et cetera. And, um, but it is a failure to not be open and honest and coaching someone through it. Right. And it has taken me a very long time to, you know, really kind of split out what, you know, you don't have to be a friend of everyone. You can be kind and supportive, but part of that is also delivering hard news and coaching them through something that they're not doing well at. Right. Um, and, and that, will hurt not only them in their career, but it will also hurt the team. And so it's, um, it's, it was, it's been a long process to go through it. It's hard, but it's just so important. Definitely. And I think, I think what what goes with that is just even what you kind of touched on is being authentic. It's like being your authentic Mm -hmm. self. And, you know, even if it's hard to tell them, like, you know, expressing that it's hard and and whatnot. So I think Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's really important. So Komal, I love this. And, you know, what I love to do at the end is ask two fun questions. Um, love it. So first, what's a passion that you have that's, you know, completely unrelated to any work and, you know, just a passion that you have in your day to day? Yeah. So ever since I was small, I have loved drawing and painting. I just I love arts, arts and crafts. And um, I now have a three and a half year old daughter, a one and a half year old son. And I love doing art projects with him, which means it ends up being pretty messy around our house. But um, yeah, that's just, it's such a, it's so healthy to just have a creative outlet with myself. Yes. I love that. Wow. That's so great. And okay. So my last question is what is a fun or weird talent that you have that no one else really knows about? So like a hidden talent. So what I do, I'll go first. So what I typically do is, I know you know this, but I throw blueberries up in the air and cash them. Today, unfortunately, I don't have blueberries, so an almond will have to do. <laughs> so we're going to see how this goes, all right? Okay. Okay. okay, so here it is. It's hard to see, but anyway, okay. Love it. There we go. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. <laughs> do you ever yell, go, like after you No, get then it. I might choke. No. <laughs> oh, right. Right, right. Don't do it. Okay. After I do. After. But anyway, um, okay, so this one's kind of weird, and I would say my my husband and my kids know this, um, okay. and not a lot of other people do. Have you ever heard of Weird Al Yankovic? Do you know who that is? Okay, this is kind of a throwback, but okay. he's a singer who would take pop songs and rewrite them with just, like, funny lyrics, okay? okay? Yeah. Like Michael Jackson songs, Madonna songs. Yeah. And... Um, I don't really do this on purpose, but I'm also terrible at song lyrics. Like I just don't know what singers are singing. So I'll end up making up my own words and I'm not going to sing for you right now, but well, do you know Bon Jovi? Yeah, of course. Okay. So there's a song called Bed of Roses. Okay. Yeah. And there's a line where he says, I want to lay you down on a bed of roses because at night I sleep on a bed of nails. Okay. And what I have remixed it to is... I want to lay you down on a bed of spinach because at night I sleep on a bed of kale, right? It's just oh, cheesy wow. and silly, but like, that. it just, and I don't sit and think about this. It's just, I'm like cooking in the kitchen and this stuff comes up in mind. I start singing it to my family. And, oh my God. Um, and that now is great. Yeah, wow. So that's a great one. I'm sure your kids love that. That is so like fun and it's cute. I love it. Turns out my three and a half year old already thinks I'm weird. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> It'll only get weirder. It's okay. Yes, that's right. Well, anyway, thank you again. I've loved hearing your story and just, you know, so many lessons. I'm just so excited for others to learn from you as well. So thank you. I appreciate you coming. Thank on the show. you, Carly. I really appreciate what you do with this podcast and, and the people who you talk to. Um, so thank you as well.